Quickly to order. Roll call, please. Roy Wesley. Here. Alderman Coles. Here. Alderman Shockey. Alderman Szymarski. Here. Alderman Eugene Wesley. Here. Alderman Winger. Here. Alderman Lazara. Here. Alderman Woods. Here. I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes from October 27, 2011. I'll second it. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion passes. Um, report of a recommendation, fiscal year 2011 audit report. Okay, Brad, all yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as was provided in your packet on Friday, I gave you it was four things um, for discussion tonight. I uh, gave you a copy of the audit report itself. Uh, we'll refer to it probably as the CAFR as we go through it. Um, the management letter, which is the report of findings of inter report on internal controls, which is kind of what they found that we're doing incorrectly downstairs, uh, if there was anything. The uh, letter to those charged with governance, and then uh, last year, it was requested that we put together a chart of the grants that the city has received, and we hadn't really vetted it through you guys yet, and so we wanted to bring it to you um, here tonight just to make sure that everybody's okay with the format and the content before we actually put it in an official city document. Um, and so with that said, to kind of go through the report and kind of explain the governance, the internal controls report and the CAFR itself. Uh, we have our partner with Wolf and Company, Mr. Mike Senko here tonight. He's gonna go through some highlights of each of those and then uh, be more than happy to answer any questions that you might have um, after or if you have any as we go through, we can address them at that time as well. Okay, thank you, Brad. Uh, thank you, Chairman and uh, Mayor and Alderman for being committed to us, working with the city of Wooddale and Brad and Anthony is is definitely a true pleasure, and you don't say that everywhere. So we appreciate that. Um, so again, thank you. And doing this report tonight, before I get into the numbers, is truly a pleasure because you are, I think, um, in an elite category from our perspective. We do a lot of village audits, city audits, uh, special district audits, and overarching, uh, looking at it uh, from a high level, from a financial point of view, very, very strong. So congratulations, and you guys should be commended on that. Um, what I want to do is go through the report, look at some high-level stuff. If you flip right to the financial tab, the independent auditor's report is the most important document throughout the entire report. It indicates whether you receive the highest level of assurance from our perspective and unqualified opinion. And that said, you did receive an unqualified opinion. So that is the ultimate goal of, of any audit conducted. Moving on to the management discussion and analysis is a document prepared by management. We review it. We do not audit it. It's a new requirement. Well, it was a new requirement with GASB 34, Government Accounting Standards Board, which was a comprehensive change, uh, which Excuse begins me. on page two. There you go. That's what I want, page two. So that will go that will go with the table of contents. It will go paid page two through page ten. Again, written uh, written by uh, written by management. Then you'll come come upon the basic financial statements. Page eleven. This is a comprehensive or an overview of the city as a whole, taking into account long-term uh, long assets, non-current assets, and non-current liabilities. So you have a governmental activities comment, uh, or column, and then a business type activities column. The difference here is just the business type activities is more in line with your commercial type activity, where a governmental activity is focused on your current flow of resources is, is the main difference. So moving down from, from my perspective, one of the most important figures is your unrestricted net assets. In the first column, the governmental activities at 13,191,299 indicates what is available for spending on page 11. 
And then moving over from there is the 8745299 in the business type activities. Again, on page 11 within the, in the unrestricted area. Now moving on to the next page, page 12 and 13. If you, can, if, if you think of it in the private world sector, here's your in, almost like your income statement and your profit and loss statement taking into consideration changes from a non-current point of view in assets and liabilities. What this shows is a change in assets of $600,000 reduction in the governmental activities and a million to, to eight, 509 in the business type resulting in a combined increase in net assets of 623, 686. So moving on to page 14, I had indicated with GASB 34, the two statements that we went through originally or the government-wide statements taking into consideration the non-current assets and non-current liabilities. From a governmental's perspective, uh, I really focus in on the general fund. It's a true indication uh, of the health of, of the city. And the number, <coughs> excuse me, the number that I'd like to point out on page 14 in the first column in the general fund, the 10,422,052. This is a good indication of the stability and what you do with this number is if you turn to page 16, you compare that 10,422,052, and you take kind of an annual, you, you take an annualized approach to your expenditures. So what we try to do is, mo uh, there's a lot of villages out there to try to stay about 20%. And as you can see, you're approaching, almost, you have a, almost a full year of annualized expenditures in your unrestricted, unreserved fund balance. And that's why, what my original comment, that's what that is geared towards. So if you go over to page 17 and not look, I, I hate to look back, but back to page 15, what these two pages do is they reconcile from a governmental point of view to more of an enterprise point of view taking into account the non-current activities. Again, standard reporting that you see with, with GASB 34. Page 18, 19, and 20, assess your proprietary funds, which is more of the business type activities. By definition, these are the funds that are supported by revenue by, for, for services performed. Page 21 and 22, your fiduciary funds, uh, as you can see here, the, the police, police pension fund. And on page 22, you will see, <clears throat> excuse me, a net increase uh, in assets of a million five, uh, one million five hundred twelve seven ninety eight, which again is a positive sign. So without boring you to death, beginning on page 23, if I haven't done so already, through page 45 is just the analysis or the detailed explanation of what you'll see in this report with, with footnotes. So it's all of our uh, promulgated language that we're required to disclose to, if I could step all the way back to the beginning of the report, which you had received your certificate uh, of excellence in financial reporting, which again uh, is a great thing to receive as well and is uh, a direct reflection of, of what Brad and Anthony are doing. So RSI, the required supplemental information, again, is unaudited information, just additional required disclosure from GASB 34 uh, in the presentation there that we're now required to put it in. So if you move on past through page 50, here throughout the rest of the report is just what it does is it takes the stuff that we just went over and it really drills down. So the folks, most of the, most of, the, uh, of the bond rating folks are probably going to stop at this point in time. They looked at the information up front. They may go to the back to drill down, but the, the real interest is on the basic financial statements in the front. So without going into a lot more detail, I think I'll stop there and just indicate that our audit was conducted um, under general accepted auditing standards in conjunction with Governmental Accounting Standards Board. To reiterate, we went through all internal, the internal control analysis in all material respect. Um, everything that we went through was in place opera and operational from our point of view. 
So we can, we can step back to this if you'd like. And the statistical section is, again, just a, a, a section that's required for you to get your certificate, um, certificate of Achievement in Financial Reporting through the Government Finance Officers Association, also referred to as GFOA. So that's the report, and we can come back to that if you want. If you move on to, Brad had indicated, the report on internal controls this will be the first page. And it just explains um, different, different categories that we have to classify, material weakness, a significant deficiency, or a control deficiency. Again, from the city's perspective, <clears throat> excuse me, as I had indicated, Everything from an internal controls point of view and all material is spec checked out. You had two comments in the prior year, uh, the water billing manual adjustment and the journal entries. Those two recommendations had been implemented. And then the last comment, which was a repeat from the prior year, is just some recording of capital assets and keeping a little better track there. Yes, Mayor. Chairman. Who's first? I don't care. Right. Who wants go to go ahead. first? You can go first. Alderman Wesley. I, I have a, a comment. And I, I will, I did read your report, believe me. Great. Um, we'll, we'll ask our department. Obviously, this is the, the last one, the capital assessment. Um, and, and you made a comment that it was noted on us for the last audit report that we did not that was on there before, am I correct by that statement? Correct. Right. So my question to staff, why didn't we correct that problem if it was noticed from last year? Why is it a repeat from last year? I would assume when we do an audit report, obviously we only had three comments from the auditor. Two of them have been taken care of. I have a hard time accepting a repeat on an audit report that we did not do anything about the, exactly a repeat from the last audit report. So my question to you, or uh, I believe you were the accounting firm at last year too, right? That's correct. So my question to you is why do we not correct that problem yet? And why is it on this report again? I, I, I mean, that's, <coughs> I, I, I like to hear why that wasn't done. Because I was hoping I was coming in here and there wasn't going to be any, but obviously there is. Go ahead. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> um, the portion of this that's still open is the fixed assets software portion of it. And over the last couple of years, uh, Mr. Fashoda and myself, we've demoed probably five or six of them. And none of them can do anything any better than the Excel program that we're using right now. And while it does appear in here, um, since there was no added utility, no added benefit to spending money to buy a software package that would do the exact same thing that we're doing now, we didn't feel it in the best interest of the city's resources to spend money effectively to get the same thing that we already have. And, you know, we know it's in there, but again, we didn't feel it prudent um, to spend money to get to the same place. May, may. I think he wants to follow up. Oh. And if I could add to that, um, this comment is a common comment. This comment really reflects best practices. So it, it, it allows the, the, most, the most efficient manner to keep track of your capital assets. With GASB 34, it was a comprehensive change where you had to keep track of these assets, depreciate these assets. In the past, you never had to do that. So we say, um, so it's not taxing on the staff. It's most accurately reported. This is the best practice. Now, if you've determined, and, and, and Brad has determined that cost to benefit isn't there, we're still required to put in best practices to say, this is what we'd like to see you get to. You've indicated in your management response, if you'll see management will investigate as taken, and other reliable tracking methodologies. If you've analyzed those from our perspective, we're still required to report it in this, it's called a SAS 115 letter, Statement on Auditing Standards. So uh, from my point of view, that, that's how I would respond to that. You want more? Yeah, I, I, I have a follow-up. <clears throat> a couple of years, 
what was it last year or the year before we updated all the software down in the finance department? Was that last year? Springbrook, uh, about three years ago, actually. Okay. So, again, so we're looking at the cost savings by not, you're saying it wasn't worth the money to invest something to keep track of this. That's the obligation <coughs> that I'm getting out of the, the question I'm getting. Above and beyond what was originally implemented uh, when GASB 34 came on board, correct. But when GASB 34 came on board, did we know, and when did that come on board, may I ask? Was it 04, 03 yeah. or 04? Okay, so I, my follow-up still, the question is, what is it, have we priced what it would cost to add some software to correct this problem? Uh, because I really would like to sit up here one year and, and not see any written down at all. I mean, I, I, believe me, I, I'm very proud of all the report that we do have here. But when I get a repeat on that, that's a little disturbing. And now you're telling me just because we're looking at cost savings, it wasn't worth doing it, but it showed up on the audit report. And I understand you got to put it down, but it's still in our audit report. So it's still a document that shown that you know you can't sit here and say we aren't gonna do anything about it. We need to do something about it. And it's up to the council to decide, bring a proposal to us, and it's up to the council to decide if we want to invest the money to do it or not. Remember, we are looking at a lot of money here. I don't know where this comes in play with the money, but that is the issue here. And anything audit report or anything to do with our financing, I'll tell you one thing. I would not I would be more than happy to sit up here, and if it means that it's going to cost us another twenty, thirty thousand dollars to keep the financing intact the way it is, and, and, and make sure we know where that money is being spent and the way it's, the access is going, I would vote yes for it. But until you guys came to, you need to bring that to us and see what the cost process is going to be. It's us as council members to decide. And what bothers me is that it's on the audit report again, and no one has brought it to us before that, now you're throwing out that it was a money issue or, or, or we didn't think it was cost. What happened last year with the cost? Did you say that to us last year? Because I'll tell you one thing, if you would have sat here and told me last year it's a cost savings or, or we don't have, didn't think it was worth the money, I would have told you to go back and bring it to me and I wouldn't be up here and I probably would have spent the money or whatever, look at the cost and do the project. That's my concern about the money situation. It's a lot of money here. We are representing the city for the money situation and, and having a repeat of the same thing and not bring it to the council level at the cost, what it would cost to fix, knowing that it's a repeat, that is quite disturbing to me. Would you like to respond? Sure. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, we can certainly investigate. I mean, I think the cheapest one we saw was I know six to eight thousand dollars, and I think the most expensive one we saw was about twenty thousand dollars. And at the end of the day, Excel did exactly the same thing that the twenty thousand dollar one did. So we could spend twenty thousand dollars and get it out of this report and be no better off. Um, I mean, and and we've talked I think all three years with with Wolf about this particular comment, and you know I think I don't know how many. If I, it's just to, to counter for a second, how many of the communities that you audit have a separate fixed asset software? Probably about 25%. Okay. Yeah. So 75% of all the communities that they audit, and you guys audit, what, 60, 70 communities? Just, they all still use Excel. So they all have this note every year, just like we do, pretty much for the exact same reason. So I, we can investigate it and bring back some options for you. But like I said, I mean, to spend money to be no better off doesn't make a whole lot of sense from the finance department's point of view. But we can we can bring it to you. Well, I think if it, an audit report, you always audit reports are always going to find something because if we don't find something, he's, we're going to think that he's not doing his job. So <laughs> it's always going to be something. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Alderman Wesley, would you like a report back on this and put on? 
Well, we we put it on the agenda for further discussion, if you like. No, that's okay. Thank you. Okay. Mayor. And uh, the police pension, pages forty-seven and forty-nine. I don't know if I'm reading this right. Funded ratio was seventy on page forty-seven, two thousand ten. Seventy point two four percent was what it was funded. It's towards the bottom. The funded ratio? Right. Is that what the... Yeah, fluxes, right. As far as and, that's an actuarial calculation. And but, then, yeah, sorry. But then on page 49, show percentage of ARC con contributed 89%. So, so, I mean, does that bring us up or... No, that, maybe I'm not understanding this. Yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of apples and oranges when you're comparing the two. There's the actuarial calculation of your ARC or your annual annual required contribution. What the actuary says that they would probably like to see you contribute, can or you you don't have to contribute that, um, which then doesn't correlate with what the actuarial uh, valuation of the total overall assets are of the plan overarching, not on an individual year-by-year -year basis. But if we make that contribution, does that bring us up to 89% funded or? No, if you were to make the full contribution, your, I mean, as far as, I think I went into CPA because actuarial was maybe <laughs> too much, too many numbers, but it may increase you one or 2% oh, if you would contribute the full, right. And the 70%, just again, from an overarching perspective, us looking at our other, uh, other cities and villages and districts that, that are in IMRF, 70.36% uh, is above the average, I can tell you that, from a funding point of view. Because everyone's getting, I mean, with, with what's going on in the market and the economy, everyone's, as you can see, from the 90 in 12, at 12, 31, 2005, down to the 70, you see that all over. Okay. Well, then, what did you get number one up? Is that for me? Okay, go ahead. Back to the asset tags. Do we actually tag the assets? And you're documenting them on a spread Excel spreadsheet? Go ahead. Thank you. Um, a good number of the assets don't have physical tags on them, um, mostly because a lot of the way our capitalization threshold is set, um, the majority of the stuff that is tagged um, are like vehicles, um, the actual buildings and stuff like that. Um, the stuff that we could probably tag would be like the servers, um, Maybe uh, like the uh, the computers and the squads or the cameras and the squads, um, but that stuff though as well. That if it disappeared, we would know about it immediately. Like if somebody walked off with the server, we would know about it. Um, if they got into a squad, it didn't have a camera, we know about it. So a lot of the stuff doesn't have tags or doesn't lend itself to tags. Um, so the vehicles, they all have unit numbers that we track them that way. So that in essence is its tag, I guess. Um. Um, second question or second part of that question maybe goes to the auditor also. What would be the effective difference between the program and what we're using now? And if we just call Excel a program, do we comply? If I understand the question correctly, I think the difference would be this would be an interactive or um, what I want to say, I can't think of the term right now, where when you enter in a capital outlay expenditure, it would automatically be recorded as a capital asset. So the two systems would kind of speak to one another. Excuse me. Yes, sir. Jeff. Sorry. Go ahead. So, so the two systems would speak to one another? So if you enter it in over here, it will record it over here, as opposed to an Excel spreadsheet. If you put an item in as a capital outlay, then we determine based upon your threshold, which is indicated on 27, if it's uh, machinery and equipment and it's over the threshold, then you go to the Excel spreadsheet and you in input it on the spreadsheet. It's just better to have a system that is linked together 
as a module of your, your regular system or they can speak to your actual GL package, enter it in, and automatically have it. That's why I said originally it's an efficiency thing as well. And it increases the accuracy and so. Okay, and, and Brad Springbrook doesn't have an asset manage it module for their system? It does. Um, it was fairly limited in that regard um, when we looked at it. Was it six months ago, eight months ago, something like that? It was pretty limited for what it did. We saw other ones that were not Springbrook that were better, <laughs> but then you get into the issue of compatibility and trying to get them to speak to each other. So the Springbrook one would obviously speak to Springbrook because it's within the same software, but it was, it was pretty limited in its uh, utility, where the ones that were better didn't have a direct tie into Springbrooks, there'd be some manual manipulation. And again, if we're manually manipulating it, then we're really no better off than we are now. Um, so could we <coughs> get Excel to transport information or, or take it to uh, a database access and make that work? I'm just looking at you know the, the bigger question and it's tracking all the assets, big and little, and, and what are their concerns, uh, as you know, Eugene <coughs> touched upon, um, and what can we do about it, and keeping your concerns in there too, of you know, spending more money than we have to to track them. But obviously, it's a concern because the government's made it a rule, and the auditor's going to come and check it off every time he comes here. So maybe it's something that we do need to address. Sure, and, and the a database dump, it's possible. Unfortunately, um, Springbrook isn't built is not built on an SQL database. It's built on a progress database, and so a lot of the rules and file paths that would be familiar with Excel and Access, based on uh, built on that SQL platform, aren't in the Springbrook database backend. So there'd be quite a bit of additional mapping and, and field tracking to, to get to that. Not to say that's not possible, but the, the database sets aren't completely compatible uh, straight away. Okay, well, it sounds like you got a little work cut out for you. Thank you. Hello, Leslie. Back up here. Did you say we do have a software in the Springbook now or we don't have it? We do not have it currently. It's available, um, but we would have to purchase it from Springbrook. It's a separate oh, was it out? Okay, that's my thing. <coughs> so do we want to look at Okay. I was just going to say, if, if we had it and we weren't using it, then that would be really bad on staff, but, but we don't have it currently. Um, and so which we, so we would have to purchase it. We can take a look at it again. Um, there's also the infamous uh, upgrade to a new version of Springbrook. And so the fixed assets module in that might be better than the one in the version we're in now. Um, so it might be a more holistic systems analysis um, than just this. But we'll certainly take another look at it. Um, certainly before the beginning of the year when we get into the CAP and the budget. And we'll have an answer for you at that time. Is it a fair statement, Brad, to, that you could give a, give us uh, information only of how much to upgrade to Springbrook and by January? Oh, certainly, yeah. I got a quote uh, a few months ago that I could probably dust off and it'd be pretty close. So. Well, that, uh, okay. Anything else? Any other questions? Okay, go ahead. Let's say um, we do uh, like to pass a resolution at the council meeting approving the audit. So we do like to have a motion from the committee recommending approval of the audit report to go to the council. Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve the audit from 2011. I'm sorry. Take roll call. Yes. Uh, roll call, please. Alderman Roy Wesley? Yes. 
Alderman Coles? Yes. Alderman Sismarski? Yes. Alderman Eugene Wesley? Yes. Alderman Winger? Yes. Alderman Lazara? Yes. Alderman Woods? Yes. Is that it? That's all I had on that one, yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the report. Thank you. <clears throat> um, items be considered at the future meeting, revenue handbook, December. Audit engagement, December. Strategy plan, December. Anything else? Anyone else like to add anything else? Okay. Um, before we go to German and finance, I would like to uh, thank uh, the city and the residents uh, for their sympathy on my father's passing away. It was very uh, kindly for the city and the residents of uh, to show their sympathy for my father, and I appreciate it. So thank you very much. And on that case, um, I'm need a motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, I'm sorry. I forgot to thank the VFW and the American Legions too. Okay, planning. Okay, who's next? You wanna? Uh, Mr. Mermis, would you like the planning, zoning, and building to go next? Yeah, I think we can resume our regular order now. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to call to order the uh, Planning, Zoning, and Building Committee of November 10, 2011. Will the minute taker please reflect same members are present? So I do declare a quorum. Uh, next being the approval of minutes dated October 13, 2011. Um, so I do make that motion to approve those minutes. Is there a second? Second. Anything on the uh, question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <clears throat> motion carries. And there's one abstention. Uh, six that do approve it. So it does pass. Uh, next item is uh, item number four, report and recommendation on the commuter station coffee um, options. We've been wrestling with this one for a while. So with that being said, uh, Mr. Forrest, uh, can you take us through the current situation? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Yes, I can. <laughs> the issue was uh, staff did uh, some additional interviews with prospective vendors uh, to make a de final determination whether the city should either subsidize or provide a staffed coffee service or contract with a vendor to provide vending machines for beverages at this train station. Uh, as you all are aware, the original coffee vendor discontinued services earlier this year after approximately 10 months in business due to poor sales and no indication that sales were going to increase in the future. Uh, we've been unable to find an independent vendor that would want to uh, open the coffee service station again, providing a staffed coffee uh, uh, and you know breakfast sandwiches type services. The biggest problem we have are the restrictions imposed by the DuPage County Health Department for somebody to actually work in the coffee station. The restrictions that they've imposed uh, really make it uh, difficult for a vendor to prepare any food or drinks on site. They're unable to do that. At the time the station was built, we just did not have the physical room to comply with the health department requirements, which would have meant, uh, you know, an in-floor grease trap. They would have had a three compartment commercial sink. There would have had to have been commercial refrigeration available. I mean, we just didn't have the room. And really this train station was never really meant to be a snack shop. Mm -hmm. I mean, it would be a nice service to offer the commuters if we could. Um, we tried to take the route of finding uh, some sort of vending machines that they could have uh, installed on the countertop. We could have just left the roll-up door up, had the vending machines there. But I've talked to two separate uh, vending companies and also the Canteen Corporation. They can't find any vending machines that would be what we're talking about, countertop. The only type of vending machines we'd be able to install there would be the floor mounted machines. Uh, we thought about maybe putting a vending machine outside the building, but if we wanted to provide coffee in it, then you have the issue of a water line 
being run out and you take the potential for that to freeze and damage the machine. As far as putting floor mounted vending machines in the station, don't really know where we could put one where it would comfortably fit. I mean, I suppose we could just put it near where the coffee service was. Um, the problem is it would probably just end up as a target for graffiti and vandalism. And I don't really know if we, even if we put vending machines in there, it would not be a guarantee that either a private vendor or the city would find them profitable at all. So at this point, staff's recommendation is to revisit providing coffee service at such time as uh, it can be demonstrated that the ridership at the station is increased and would probably support a coffee service. I mean, I would think possibly uh, maybe on special occasions we could, mm -hmm. I'm sure we could get Gus to open it for a couple of days, maybe around Christmas shopping season, something like that. I think he would be agreeable to that. But, uh, you know, we, we discussed using fraternal or charitable organizations to staff mm -hmm. the coffee service, although the city attorney has strongly discouraged that due to health department regulations and also liability issues that could put the city in a position of vulnerability. So that's our recommendation is to see what happens in the future. Okay, and then can you refresh my memory why we can't just have someone pouring coffee, literally just coffee and the urn out there and... It would have to be prepared at an approved facility that's mm -hmm. licensed by the health department. So it's not like we could just make a couple of pots of coffee. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we were going to do that maybe one day for the commuters, I don't okay. think it would be an issue. Mm -hmm. But to actually open it on a regular basis, uh, the health department would want to be assured that it had been prepared at a licensed facility and that the person working in the coffee service uh, was working under the stewardship of somebody who has been issued a food license. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, does anyone have any questions? Alderman UT Wesley? I recommend that we take the staff recommendation not move forward with this at this time. Um, so that will be my motion. You're, so you're making a motion not to move forward at this time? Right, because there's nothing else to do with it. I, do we need a motion or is this more like just drop it? Let's get a consensus. Yeah, motion, but it's not like we're going to take it to the council meeting next week, but consensus on what to do. Okay. So there is a motion to not move forward at this time. Is there second. a second? Anything on the question? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries. Um, thanks for carrying it on, though, Mr. Forrest, and not, you know, totally, and not dropping it and looking at all the options for us. Thank you. Sure. Next item is uh, the City of Wooddale floodplain buyout policy, and there's two different scenarios outlined in, in the description. So with that, Mr. Forwards, can, can you take us through the overview? Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, we, during some discussions about uh, applying for grant money and so forth several months ago, uh, it was revealed that the city really doesn't have any formally adopted guidelines on how to spend monies uh, when we get or when we find grant programs that are available to buy out flood damaged properties and we don't have any line items in the budget for the city to be buying out flood damaged properties. So staff was requested to try and come up with some recommendations for policies and procedures. Over the past few decades, there have been several properties in the Salt Creek floodplain that have been purchased either by DuPage County or the city of Wooddale using grant monies uh, from a variety of sources and determining which property owners voluntarily wanted to be included in it. The structures are then purchased, then demolished, and the property returned to open spaces. Uh, I did work with Bill Blecky coming up with some of these recommendations. And he brought up the point that it should be noted that the DuPage County Stormwater Management Group apparently has not been funded by the county for flood floodplain property buyouts for around five years. So funds are kind of drying up at the county level as well. So mm -hmm. I think you're where we are in the midst of applying for some grant monies from the Fed right now. And that process is moving along. Uh, so staff was requested to present the city council with recommendations for incorporating into a formal policy and procedure governing the purchase of the flood-prone properties within Wooddale. Boy, that's a tongue twister, isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, 
Uh, it seemed like a system of prioritizing prospective properties for purchase first needs to be established and implemented. And rather than establish a budget line item completely funded by the city, staff was directed to establish policies and procedures on how the grant monies will be spent when they're available for the purchase of such properties. Using city tax dollars and other general revenues for the benefit of such a small percentage of the households in town does not seem a prudent use of the local tax dollars. We should continue to apply for and utilize county, state, or federal programs to achieve the removal of the properties that are prone to reoccurring flooding. So some of the recommendations we came up with for establishing the policies, uh, the first set would be for properties that are located within the floodway and or the regulatory floodplain of the Salt Creek watershed. And the first one of those would be to determine what structures are located in the dedicated floodway. These should be considered first for the buyout because the properties in the floodway by ordinance are, it's very restricted what you can do, what you can build there, what you can replace or repair there once it's damaged. And it's my understanding, uh, if you remember in September of 08, when we had a lot of flood damaged properties, the figure that FEMA would allow you to restore your property would be if it was damaged less than 50% of its value. It's my understanding that next time we have a major flooding event, that figure is gonna go down to 25% of the value. So there, we are gonna have some more properties that may have some issues during uh, you know, the next time there's a major flooding event if that occurs. And, and I'm just gonna interrupt for a moment. There are some questions, Mr. Mayor. John, on that 50%, that 50% was in a 10 year period if I remember right, right? It's, it's a cumul cumulative figure and it's also based off the assessed value of the structure. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's pretty easy to get the 50% of the value of your assessed value on a structure. Typically the assessed value is, uh, you know, is a little below market value and you deduct the land value off of it. So yeah, we could have some issues. Uh, the properties in- I'm sorry, one more. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Alderman Eugene Wilson. So are you trying to tell me that they're changing anything damaged over 25% now? That's that my understanding. Is that what you understand it now? Yes. Well, yeah. That is correct. So that means more houses along the creek, which, by the way, there's a new floodplain map that came out, which we haven't got yet, but I'm sure our engineer got. So you're trying to tell me 25%. If it goes to 25%, you're trying to tell me here uh, along Saw Creek, half these people might not be able to rebuild their house? Is that what I'm hearing here? What they would have to do to restore their house is either flood-proof it, or move it, or take it down. So basically our people along Saw Creek, it would be worth, huh? Or up the creek. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, basically up the creek because if they change that, so my question is. It would, you can't go up a creek. How fast. go down a creek. How fast are we moving with this grant money to look at helping these people out if they flood out again? I mean, because I'll tell you one thing, half the people along the creek don't have that kind of money. Well, here's the thing to keep in mind. Over the past several years, they have the houses that were the worst affected, most of those have been bought out and torn down. Uh, the current list of properties uh, that were applying for the grant, I, there's a list of probably a dozen or 15 homes uh, where the owners have expressed some interest in being pur you know, purchased. We sent letters to them you know, and we need a definitive yes or no whether they would be interested in being involved in the program. We've just received those letters back, and I think we sent out 14 letters. 17, 17 letters, I'm sorry. Uh, we have six yeses that they would like to be included, two no's, and eight no responses. So we haven't received those responses yet from about half of the people. And so as soon as we get this information together, we can get the final application in. There was an initial application put in uh, in the spring for some grant monies. We were accepted, those properties were accepted and then we were sent what they called the long form, which is about a 40 page application. And as uh, the city engineer and I have been working getting that completed, they've been also changing some of the parameters for properties that could be included. So that list has now grown from three to 17 prospective properties for purchase. Oh. So 
May I do a follow-up? Yes. <clears throat> so we have 17 that did not respond to the letter. Eight. Eight. Correct. Okay. So my question to you is, when was that letter sent out? I think it was, I want to say late September, or early October. Okay. So are we doing a reach out to these people that did not respond, maybe go over to their house or call them on a phone and say, hey, did you receive this letter? Because I'll we tell you one thing, I would, if, if I lived along the creek, I'll tell you right now, I would be jumping on the bandwagon and signing up. Okay, and maybe these people don't understand that they're changing it. In that letter, did we state that it was changing to 25? Was it mentioned in that letter? I don't believe it was. Well, then I suggest that we go back and send a letter out to those people again and say it's going to be 25%. It's going to be. Mm -hmm. Do we know for a fact that it's changing 25? <coughs> I so believe it's all it hearsay. Yes. That's why it wasn't. Uh, yes. That's why it wasn't included in the letter. That's at, at right, right now, that's what they're contemplating, dropping it down to 25%. I have not seen anything that, that definitively says it's 25%. So when will we know if they drop it down 25? Uh, I'll follow up. I, I, I don't know. Uh, and I, can't, I can't answer that at this point. We'll follow up on it and get some more information. Uh, we can definitely do that as well as you know, uh, follow up on the ones that did not respond. OK. Um, can I just follow up on one comment that you made? Uh, we did receive the new floodplain maps. <clears throat> Excuse me, they, they only completed the ones for Salt Creek at this point. Um, any of the other tributaries outside that area are not included on it. Um, they also uh, sent it to us on 11 by 17 sheets. Uh, we've asked the county for electronic versions so that we can compare the differences and, and, and look at what, what the changes are and how it impacts the community. Uh, we, we requested that earlier this week, and we we're hoping to hear back from them you know, as soon as possible to get it. Again, to get that electronic copy, drop it into our GIS. That way we can graphically look at the impacts or the changes uh, uh, that were made as part of that study. Alderman Bray Wesley? 25%. Where are we with the, uh, the 25%? We sit up here for months and months and months for the county. These residents pay taxes to the county and everything else. Why are we, why are we getting to the county a little more? If they're going to lower 25%, why aren't they fix? Why aren't they trying to fix faster with the reservoir and, and the uh, Bussy Woods and friends of uh, Bussy Woods or whatever, whatever is called the group. This is this is ridiculous. We're going to watch our people here in Wooddale go under in the creek and lose everything that they have. And you know what? We sit up here for months and months. We're sitting here fighting. But you know what? I'm getting tired, tired of seeing you up here and saying, where's the county? Where's the county? What are they doing? What's Cook County doing? Nothing. Mr. Mermis? Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, staff was just uh, recently, actually this week, at a meeting with uh, SOC uh, communities to discuss this very problem. You may remember Elk Grove uh, uh, heading up or spearheading the uh, flooding study um, with the lowering of uh, the dam at uh, Bussy Woods mm -hmm. to help alleviate some of these problems. We cost shared in the initial phase of the study and uh, currently um, we're looking to move forward with phase two, um, working with uh, Cook County and DuPage County is a collaborative effort, I think, moving forward. Um, so we are working on that with Elk Grove. You'll soon uh, be uh, hearing about this in further detail on whether or not you want to participate further in, this, in the study to continue it forward. Um, it's supposedly going to potentially alleviate some of our flooding issues there. And we've been jointly um, having a couple meetings with the village Ita of Itasca to uh, help uh, lobby the county on uh, both of our behalfs to help with flooding issues outside of the uh, Elk Grove sponsored study. So we, are, we have been uh, proactive in these uh, issues. Okay, okay. I, I'm gonna call in uh, the mayor and then I want uh, Mr. Forrest to be able to get through the rest of his overview before, before we keep asking questions. Mr. Mayor. I just wanna follow up to uh, Alderman Eugene Wesley. The people that did not respond 
Are we holding up the application because they didn't respond? Because if that's the case, I'd really like to get yes or no answers so we can send that the list in or the, the application and so we it, we it's my understanding it gets reviewed at a certain time of the year, so nothing has been held up. Um, we've already submitted the, the preliminary application and been approved in certain instances, then set out the additional ones, but they review it when they review it from, from my understanding. So nothing's being held up. I think the secondary review would happen in uh, December or January, Al. Well, okay, December or January. That, with the holidays, I mean... I'd really like to at least get a yes or no from those residents. Let's get them on the phone, whatever we got to do. Yes, no, and send it in before the holidays because things tend to get lost around the holidays. This whole issue is a, a priority for staff to make right. sure. And I, I know that. I just, I, he brought it up, and I was just curious if we were waiting or what, what the deal was. All right, so in prioritizing these properties. And one thing to remember too is that several of the properties in the Salt Creek area that have been subject to reoccurring flooding have been purchased over the last 20 years and torn down. So I, I don't mean to downplay being flooded. I personally lived in a house that's, that suffered reoccurring flooding. I know the terror when uh, you'd get a big rainstorm just waiting for something to happen where the house started to flood. So I can empathize with those people. Yet at the same time, since that's down to such a small percentage of households right now, that may be why it's to the county or maybe the state, you know, it only affects six or eight homes in Wooddale. So you know what, we got other things we're gonna worry about. That may be where they're coming from as well. But we will get this finished up and sent in. As far as prioritizing, again, it's, it's our opinion, the first properties that should be looked at would be any properties that are remaining in the floodplain. So those are the most restrictions. The next would be properties that might be subject to reoccurring flooding during an event that would not qualify as a hundred year flood. Again, those are, we're just kind of going down the ladder to the ones that are the most susceptible. Third would be determine what properties are subject to reoccurring flooding during a 100 year event. And lastly, determine what properties are subject to reoccurring flooding during a 500 year event. So, when we get to properties that are located within the city limits, but outside of the Salt Creek regulatory floodplain, we would need to determine if the property experiences reoccurring flooding due to regional stormwater drainage patterns or issues that have not been exacerbated by past or current owners of the property and maybe have been caused by subsequent development, change of grades or lack of maintenance. And then number two, we would need to determine if alternatives exist to correct the situation prior to initiating buyout action. We do, I think the council's aware, we've had some properties on the north side of town, we've had some properties over in Ward 1 and the south side of town uh, subject to reoccurring flooding. Uh, we even had one house over near Georgetown. Uh, would those qualify for a flood buyout? Probably not from the Salt Creek money, but you know, those are the ones we have to look at, uh, maybe some alternatives. Mm -hmm. So we would need to reference the floodplain maps. We'd have to shoot elevations on site, uh, doing a study to determine whether the property is located in a floodway or a 100-year floodplain or a 500-year floodplain, because you don't necessarily have to be on Salt Creek to be in a floodplain. There are a couple of little pockets of areas that due to elevations are technically considered a floodplain. So that, those, that might be something that would enter into it as well. Uh, again, in areas outside of the floodplain, we would still have to shoot elevations and determine the regional stormwater flow that might adversely affect those properties. So whether the properties are located in the Salt Creek watershed or outside of the boundary, participation in a buyout program needs to be voluntary by the owners of the property. Once the city becomes aware of available funding for such a program, no matter what the source, Properties of the highest priority should be assessed and those owners contacted determine if they are willing to participate. So that's kind of the direction we're going and you know, we welcome comments from this group. Sure, a couple of questions. So just in the outline, there's the section of the uh, properties located within the floodway or floodplain and then the ones outside of the Salt Creek floodplain. Now, are you saying that it still would be taken priority with the floodplain first 
and then outside it, or are those two categories going to both be number one, have priority, the same priority? I think they would have equal priorities because we too. do have some of these properties, for example, on the north side of town mm -hmm. and on the south side of town, experience reoccurring flooding when we don't necessarily have flooding in, in, you know, in the floodplain area. Right. So we do have to look at each case individually. Okay. And then just my second follow-up before I call on others. Um, where do condemned properties fit in this framework? Would anything condemned be even handled outside of this? Or, yeah. Yeah, the only properties that, uh, you know, we started to bring forward for condemnation and demolition were foreclosed ones that are sitting vacant, and that's still queued up depending on the outcome of, uh, you know, this grant money being released. I mean, the, the properties, are you referring to the ones that uh, I brought forward mm -hmm. probably six or eight months yep. ago for condemnation? Those were the ones that we initially applied for the grant money. Mm -hmm. So they are on the list. So I guess we might as well, at this point, you know, the properties are being maintained mm -hmm. relatively in compliance to the property maintenance code. So I guess we see if we get this grant money. And about how many are condemned, roughly? Well, staff doesn't have the authority to actually condemn them. We have uh, three properties that are posted as unsafe structures, and they're not able to be occupied okay. because of the flooding. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Alderman Coles? Um, this floodplain, have you got the whole, whole, whole map of... Uh, Wooddale are just certain sections. Did you get the whole map or certain sections? Because I heard that some of the floodplain now has been extended into Woodside, according to uh, uh, one of my constituents over there. He went for a loan. He couldn't get it because his house was in a floodplain on Spruce Street. So... Uh, have you got the whole map, or you just got just Salt Creek area? Just the Salt Creek area is the ones that are the maps that we just recently received. Um, but there's a, I new, can, there's a new one out now, supposed to be for the whole part of DuPage County in this area. Yes, and, and that's why they they re, they're they're phasing their releases out. And uh, right now they've released Salt Creek, and then um, subsequently. Uh, Tony Charlton from the county has indicated that the following maps should be coming out within the next two, three weeks um, oh, okay. following it. Um, but if you have the address, I, I'd, I'd be more than happy at checking that. It's the last house on Spruce Street in Woodside. And, of course, we have Lake Aspen. We know about that, don't we? Mr. Forrest? Yeah, I am aware of uh, a small area right at the end of the current paved Spruce Street, the property I believe that you're talking about, where there is an area where the elevations are such that it is technically considered floodplain. That's what I was referring to a few oh, minutes ago. Okay. Yeah, so that's on the radar. Alderman Roy Wesley, did you wish to add anything? Okay. And then uh, any other comments? Um, Alderman Woods? <laughs> When do you think that you'd have a, a completed policy? I mean, these are recommendations, you know, that we could use for the policy, but, I mean, really I was looking for a policy with some weighting to it so we could determine which houses are first, uh, some language in there for cover monetary issues ahead of time so it's not an open negotiation so that people moving forward can use that data to go, do I move? Do I tear it down? What do I do? Especially with the advent, if they're going to change from 50% reconstruction to 25%. I mean, mm -hmm. I think it's information that people should get. Well, a couple of comments to that. One is, it, uh, you know, I thought that prioritizing uh, sort of in the outline that I gave you would help us determine what properties should be first in line. I 
still remains to be seen how much control we'll actually have if we're getting the funds from other sources. Uh, you know, typically they would use what they consider to be a fair market value when they're making the offers to these people. Uh, right now what we're talking about are voluntary buyouts before there's an event. If we wait till after an event and then we have to try and go after the properties, it's going to be pretty obvious which ones, you know, were damaged the worst and should be first on the list.